What's up, Bloom Church? Hey, 10 o'clock. I think you can do better than that. What's up, Bloom Church? And look at that. I was right. What's up, guys? My name is Tyler Long, and I have the incredible honor of being the executive pastor here at Bloom. I've got one quick announcement before we dive in. I, I want you all to take out your phones real quick. You ready? I want you to open up that calendar app. I want you to put this in your calendar. This coming Saturday at 9 a.m., we got Saturday morning prayer going down. Come on, somebody. Listen to me. There is nothing more powerful than a church family coming together unified in prayer. Can I get an amen in the house today? So I want to see you all there. Let's pack this place out 9 a.m. next Saturday. It's going to be so powerful. And hey, before we get started, can we just go before the Lord real quick? Let's pray. I want you to just hold out your hands in a posture to receive from him today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house, God, and worship you. Father, I just, I pray right now over every single person in this room, God, that you would just allow us to hear what you have for us, God. Unblock anything in our hearts, God, and anything in our souls, God, that would, that would keep us from, from hearing the word that you have for us and let it penetrate our hearts, God. God, I pray that you just magnify what you have for us today, God. We are so expectant. Father, flow through me, God, your words, not mine. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name we pray, and all God's people at 1023 this morning said, amen. amen. Guys, I am so excited for today. We are wrapping up a series called How Do We Boast? Have you guys liked this series? Has it been blessing anybody? So powerful, right? And if you're new here, what this series is, is it's, it's been building a, a foundational understanding of who our God is so that we can walk confidently in the promises that he's given us and the calling that he has for us to impact his kingdom, right? The key scripture that we have for this is Psalms 20, verse 7. It says, some nations boast, everybody say boast, of their chariots and horses, but we boast in the name of the Lord our God. See, to boast in something is to have confidence in something. Right? To boast in something is to have trust in it. For example, of the chariots and horses, the chair that you're sitting in right now, you can, you can see it. You had to have this conscious decision of, I trust this thing is going to hold me up when I sit in it, right? But we're not called to boast in the chariots and the horses. We're called to boast in the name of the Lord our God. We boast in the blessings and in the, the names that he has given us. And remember what it says in Psalms uh, 109, or 103, excuse me, it says, Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits. Everybody say benefits. benefits. Forget not all his benefits. There are so many benefits that we receive when we step into the life-changing relationship with Jesus. And if we're going to boast in the name of our God, then we need to know what those names are and what he has promised each and every one of us in here. And so for the past three weeks, Pastor Mike has done an out-of-this-world job of breaking down that our God is, is righteous. He's our sanctifier. He's our banner of victory, our peace, our healer, our provider. And I want to just stress this more. I can't stress this enough. If you've missed any, please go to our website and check it out. You, it, is, it is so vitally important to developing a foundation of who our God is, what he's given you, so we can boast in his name. Amen? And so today, we're wrapping it up, and we're going to talk about the God who is our shepherd. If you're taking notes, write that down, the God who is our shepherd. And if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. We're actually going to be uh, in one of my favorite passages of Scripture found in Psalms 23, and it goes like this. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the, the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, this is a really popular passage of scripture, right? You might have heard this before. It's extremely popular. Hobby Lobby loves this scripture. You know what I'm saying? It's everywhere. 
And the main census, when you ask people like, hey, you know, Psalms 23, if you took a poll, they would say that it gives me this peace, it gives me this comfort, right? And it's really easy, if that's what we look at with this, it's really easy to overlook where this scripture actually came from. What, what drove this scripture to actually be? Because the reality is it's not just some words on a page, right? But it actually came from real life experiences. Does anyone know who wrote this passage? If you know it, shout it out. Anybody? David, right? And if you look at David's life, if you're not familiar with David, David was someone who went through some of life's highest highs, but he also went through some of life's lowest lows. And yet in the middle of all of that, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. And if you're not familiar with the, sta- the story of David, David was a, he was a king, right? But I don't want that to, to di- I, don't, I don't want you to discount anything now. Like, I I can't connect with that because he was a king. Well, no, yes, he was a king, and yes, he did many incredible things as a king, or earlier, you might have heard the story of him defeating Goliath, a giant, right, defeating all odds by God's mighty power, but I want to give some actual context to when David wrote this. Theologians say that, that David actually wrote this as he was going through one of the toughest darkest seasons of his life. Theologians say that that David wrote this as his son was trying to remove him from the throne, his own son. And not only that, if that wasn't bad enough, they also say that, that he wasn't just trying to remove him from the throne, but he was also trying to kill him. And yet in the midst of all of that, David still finds it within himself to cry out, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. I lack nothing. Can you imagine the feeling? Any parents in the room? Quick show of hands. Imagine the feeling of your own child trying to remove what you've worked so hard on to to accomplish as king, right? But not only that, imagine your own child then uh, coming after you and trying to kill you. But even though this is one of the toughest seasons of his life, even though he might feel betrayed, the, the, the unloyalty that he's dealing with right now, he finds it within himself to say, the Lord is my shepherd and I'm lacking nothing. And so my goal today is I want to break down Psalms 23 because I believe that Psalm 23 is a roadmap to, if you're taking notes, write this down, on how to thrive in this life. A roadmap on how to thrive in this life. And let me just tell you, this works for any and all circumstances. If you're going through something right now, Psalms 23 is for you. If you've got marital struggle going on right now, Psalms 23 is for you. Financial struggle, job struggle, whatever you're dealing with, Psalms 23 is for you. But it also works on the other side of the coin. Maybe you've got a great relationship with Jesus right now and you're feeling fired up, but you're just wondering, God, what's my next step? Can I tell you that Psalm 23 is for you? I love to to look at it like this, that, that it's a roadmap, right? And I like to think of a map of a mall. It's got many different areas that it'll say you are here. And that's us, right? Because we're all in different areas. But the point of Psalm 23 is I want to take you from wherever you are to where I want you to go. And Psalms 23 is a way that if we follow, we will get there. We will get where God wants us to go. He just wants to help us get from here to there, right? Good or bad. And something that I want you to understand so deeply today is that God is your shepherd. Everybody say, my shepherd. shepherd. And this is what I know is that a shepherd's main objective is to make sure his sheep are taken care of. Come on. That's us. God is our shepherd, and he just wants to make sure. His main objective is to take care of us. And can I be honest this morning? Can I be a little real? This might come as a shock, but like like we talked about with trusting the chair, they are reinforced. So if you do jump back in your seats, trust in it right? Farming and I were distant friends. I know, I know, it's crazy. But farming and I, we don't really know each other. We, we recognize each other. We appreciate each other, but we don't, we don't really hang out, if you know what I'm saying, right? Like, I've been around some horses. I might have rode one. Uh, I've been around some cattle. I should get bonus points, right, because I didn't say cows. Y'all know what I'm saying? Can I? <laughs> hey, that's how you know, right? <laughs> but so my viewpoint, my perspective of a shepherd, 
I'd have been a little skewed. I, I feel like I can admit that right now. Like, when I thought of a shepherd, not going to lie, I kind of thought of little Bo Peep. You know what I'm saying? Like, little Bo Peep is going to just sit under the tree. They got the little shepherd staff, but it's, it's not very, it's like this big, you know. And then you're literally going to sit there, and you're going to take care of one of the most low-maintenance animals there is. Maybe next to a sloth, right? Like, you sit there, and you're just saying, oh, no. One's starting to wander off. I guess I should go get it. And you get it, and then you bring it back, and then you go sit under your tree again. That was what I thought. Let me just say, if you're a shepherd in here, I'm sorry. (laughs) Because after further research, that is not the case, right? After further research, there's actually some pretty intense stories of what shepherds do. Uh, and David actually gives us a pretty incredible example of that that we're going to dive into in, uh, in 1 Samuel. But to set the stage, I want you to think about this. David is sitting, and he's in the act of shepherding, right? Like he's, he's getting his shepherdness on. Yes. <laughs> and this is what happens. David's shepherding when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock. I'm sorry, What? David's sitting under the tree, and a lion or a bear come, and they carry off the sheep. Can I just say, side note, if this was me, I would be like, dang, you know, like, <laughs> shucks. Must have just been his time, you know what I'm saying? Like, that was divine intervention, see you later. And if the bear started coming more to me, or towards me, I would just be like, hey, so is there anything I can do to make this more accommodating for you? Here, would you like another one? It, it can, would that help? Like, please do not... You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not about to fight no lion or no bear. God also gave me common sense and wisdom. Can I get an amen in the house today? Watch what happens next. I, let me identify. David is I, right? I went after it. It being the lion or the bear. What I went after it struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. Can we all agree that maybe this whole shepherding thing isn't just little Bo Peep sitting under the tree? You know what I'm saying? Maybe there's a little bit more intensity behind this whole shepherding thing. But it doesn't stop there. Listen to what happens next. It says, when it turned on me, after he struck it, right? Do you all see what's happening right here? The lion or the bear turned on David. He said, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and I killed it. David's a beast. You know what I'm saying? Like, this whole shepherding thing is pretty intense. Where's that action movie? You know what I'm saying? Like, Revenge of the Shepherds. <laughs> Where's that at? But I want you to think about this. This is David, right? So this is David's expectation of what a shepherd does for his sheep. You know what I'm saying? There's a little bit more weight Behind when David says, the Lord is my shepherd and what he expects a shepherd to do. And I just want to remind you today that no matter what, you have a shepherd. You have a shepherd. And right now, you might feel like like you're getting grabbed by the teeth of a lion. Right now, you might feel like you're up against the biggest, scariest bear right now. But can I tell you that you have a shepherd this morning that no matter what, will go after you, will rescue you, and bring you back to say, come on, is anyone thankful this morning for a shepherd that will go up against the scariest things to bring us back? What I love about this is David made it very clear also the relationship between a shepherd and his sheep. What I want you to notice is the verbiage that he used in the text. He didn't say the Lord is a shepherd. He didn't say the Lord is the shepherd, which would still be extremely powerful, right? Looking at it holistically, the Lord is the shepherd. But no, instead he says the Lord is my shepherd. And if you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write this down. But the Lord is our relational shepherd shepherd. Today, I want to spend some time breaking down the different characteristics of our shepherd, our God, so that we can walk confidently in knowing who our leader is. Amen? So Jesus, listen to the actual words in Jesus, or of Jesus. It says in John 10, 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me just as my father knows me, and I know the father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. 
He's a personal God who knows about you, who cares about you, who knows what you're up against. And, and what I love is that he won't just rescue you, right? He will, but he won't just rescue you, but he will deliver you. Remember the next line, or the line it says after the Lord is my shepherd is, I lack nothing. So he won't just rescue you, but he will make sure that whatever void, whatever holes that that, that line or that bear created, that stronghold, that addiction, whatever you were going through, the marital struggle, the financial struggle, whatever he's rescuing you from, he will fill that void to the point where you lack nothing. You lack nothing. Come on. The next line, he goes on. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. What I want you to see this morning is that now we're getting to the point where the direction of David's speaking shifts. He was talking about the shepherd, but now he's talking about the sheep. Now he's talking about us. And I have to say real quick, I was a little insecure about doing this message today uh, because can I just say that Pastor Mike and the creative team have kind of done an out-of-this-world job at bringing some visuals to this sermon series. Y'all know what I'm saying? Like... Pastor Mike had a dadgum canoe on the stage. You know what I'm saying? Like, next level. And so I uh, did some brainstorming myself, talked to the team. I said, hey, bring me those real sheep. Yeah. <laughs> Pastor Mike would have had real sheep. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, hey, we just didn't want y'all to smell what a real sheep smells like, so you're, thank, you know, you're welcome, it's all good. But <laughs> the next characteristic that, that this is showing us here is that the Lord is our providing shepherd. The Lord is our providing shepherd. Verse 2 says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. And I actually heard a pastor, Pastor Matt Chandler, speak on this. And it was so incredibly powerful because when he says we, he says we, when we think about green pastures, this is what we think of, right? Something so beautiful, something so luscious, something so life-filled, you know what I'm saying? But what I think is really interesting is, is when they were writing this in Israel, they only had two rainy seasons per year. And so if you think about the, the pastures that they were in, they didn't look like this. They were dry, they were, they were drought-filled, they were weird, it, it, there, was, there was no nutrients in this, right? It wasn't, it wasn't luscious, it wasn't green. And so I love the imagery that David's creating here with just throwing in that adjective that he says, he, he leads me to green pastures, right? He makes me lie down in green pastures because what he's saying here is that Jesus is going to lead you out of drought, Jesus is going to lead you out of dryness, and he's going to lead you to an area, a green pasture, where you can lie down and you can rest. And here's what I know, and I love this, because a shepherd always knows what's best for his flock. A shepherd's not going to lead you to a dry or a drought-filled pasture where you can't rest, where, where you can't find what you need to be restored, but no, he's going to lead you to a green pasture. And I love this, because... Uh, there was a custom back then where if they did have a green pasture, if it was during one of those rainy seasons, uh, the shepherd would actually lead his flock to the green pasture around noon for about three to four hours. He would lead them there, and the, uh, the whole purpose of this trip was to just let them lie down and rest. He would let them eat. He would let them drink. But that's it. He just wanted them to lie down before heading back to, to wherever he kept them. But what I think is really interesting is there was a study done on sheep, and sheep actually need four things before they can lie down. They have to have the, the following things. They, they, they can't have any fear. They can't have any friction from within the flock. They, can, they can't have any parasites in them, or they can't have any hunger. If they're feeling any of these, they physically will not lie down. And if they don't lie down, they can't rest. But do these look familiar? Yes. Come, on. Come on. Fear. What are you fearing right now? Yes. What's driving you to be unrestful? 
right? No friction from within the flock. Are you dealing with, with friction from within your flock? Are you dealing with turmoil with a friend or a family member or a, 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 a coworker? What friction are you having right now from within your flock? No parasites. Is there something within you? Maybe it's a health struggle. Is, maybe it's an unhealthy relationship. What's unhealthy in you? What's, what parasite is rising up in you? No hunger. Is your soul hungry for more? Because if you have any of these, you can't rest and you know that's the truth what keeps you up at night it's got to fall in one of these but what I love about this so we deal with this on the daily right but Jesus says if you follow me if you listen to me I will lead you to a green pasture where you don't have to worry about any of these I'll lead you to a green pasture where even if you feel like you can't lie down I got you and I will provide the rest for you to lie down. The next line, he says, he, he leads me beside quiet waters. Everybody say quiet waters. quiet waters. He leads me beside quiet waters and he refreshes my soul. And the next characteristic that, that David gives us of, of our God, of our shepherd, is the Lord is our guiding shepherd. See, the key word there is quiet. Because sheep actually happen to be very fearful. They happen to be very jumpy animals. And so if they were going to a stream or a river or something like that, and it was loud and it was making a lot of noise and it looked just very turbulent, they would not be able to step up close enough to get refreshed, to, to take a drink, right? So they would leave thirsty. And I feel they, they, they feel like they need still water. They need, they need comfortable scenarios for them to walk up, take a drink, and get refreshed. But still water is stagnant water. And does anyone know that stagnant water is the nastiest water out there? Stagnant water is where bacteria grows up. Stagnant water is where unhealthy things live. But the sheep, they don't want to grow. The sheep, they, they don't want to move, they don't want to take a step towards, towards what's, what's next. And this is why it's so powerful that he says, I'm going to lead you to a quiet water. The stream could still be going, but at least it's quiet enough for you to take a drink. God says, I'm all about baby steps. I just want to get you taking that next step. I will lead you to quiet water because this, this morning is that God just wants us to take a step. This was me, if I can be honest. This was me years ago. Where I didn't want anything to do with growth. I didn't want anything to do with anything that would bring me out of my comfort zone. It had to be comfortable. But can I tell you that in that comfort, I found stagnation. And in that stagnation, bacteria rose up within me. Poison rose up within me. And it affected more than just me. It affected my friendships. It affected my relationships. It affected what I thought the call was on my life. It affected every single aspect of my life until one day God hit me. He said, I just want you to take a step. I'm going to lead you to that quiet stream where you can feel refreshed, but I just want you to take a little baby step. For me, community was huge. Community was huge. Having someone that, that knew my name, having someone that, that knew my struggle, having someone that would say, Tyler, I see that you're going through something. Let me pray for you. Maybe you're in here today and you're feeling the same thing. You got no community. You got no one that knows your, your struggles. You got no one that, that knows your name, that knows what you're going through. Can I tell you right now, maybe God brought you here for this moment right now to say you need to take that baby step and you need to go upstairs and get signed up for a life group. Life groups is where life change happens. Life groups is where you're in a circle and people know your name. Life groups are where people know your story. Life groups are where life change happens. Come on. Get signed up. Don't go through this life alone. Maybe you're in here and you're feeling like, my purpose needs to be refreshed. Can I tell you this morning, if you're sitting in here, God has gifted each and every one of you with some incredible spiritual gifts. Incredible. Maybe that baby step that you need to take is going through our growth track. 
and using those incredible spiritual gifts that God has given you to get plugged into this life-giving community that we call our dream team that makes Bloom Church thrive. Come on. Hey, God has gifted you. If you don't feel like it, let me, trust me, God has gifted you with something so special. Don't waste it. Go through growth track. Get plugged in. Use it. Refresh your purpose. It's interesting. If, if you hear that and, may, and, and if you identify with that, it might sound really daunting. It might sound really overwhelming to, to take that baby step. But in the book, there's a book called Lead Like a Shepherd, and, and the author talks about, I love this imagery, the author talks about how if, if a shepherd were to, to lead his sheep to a, a, you know, a, a river or a stream that's really loud or the current is really heavy and they don't feel comfortable taking that step, the shepherd will actually go upstream, create a dam upstream to calm the water down below so the sheep can take that step. Can I tell you that you serve a God that is creating a dam upstream for you to take that step? Come on, and if we here as a church can help you in any way, please let us know. Go up to the Welcome Center in the top lobby or in the Welcome Center down here in the lower lobby. We would love to help you identify and take that step. So I want you to ask yourself today, what is one baby step that God wants me to take? What is it? And we're in your corner. We're here to help. The next line that David goes on, he says is, he guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. This is David can continually, he's, he's driving it home that the Lord is our guiding shepherd, right? See, sheep are terrible at directions. Like, terrible at directions. They have no instinct on, can I go here? Can I not go here? Should I go here? Should I not go here? And let me just say, this is me before Apple Maps. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Still is me. <laughs> but, but they lacked instinct, Right? This is why a shepherd's guidance is so important because they have a natural tendency to just kind of wander over here into maybe some unhealthy areas or, or wander over here into some other areas. They take it on themselves and, man, they just wander and it can lead them to getting stuck. It can lead them to a scary situation. This is also why they travel in flocks because if you have people by you, actually, can I get, can I get two volunteers real quick? Baldridge's. Can I get to y'all? Come on. Hey, can we welcome the Baldrigs up here? Y'all got your masks? Hey. Hey, come on. Let's give them one more hand real quick. <laughs> if you could stand right here, and then if you could stand right over here, I just want you to stand there and look pretty. You're doing great. This is why we do life groups. This right here. Because sheep travel in flocks. Sheep travel in flocks because they, know, they have no sense of direction. And so if they try and do it on their own, again, they're over here, they're over here, they can get lost, they can wander. But let me tell you, how powerful is it when sheep have flocks? Will you all just take a couple steps with me? If they try and wander, I can't. It's a lot harder for me to get off the rails because I'm doing life with people. I'm doing life with people who will keep me aligned with the right path that God wants me on. Come on, somebody. Hey, y'all did great. That's all I got for you. Yeah. Hey, can we give him a hand one more time? <laughs> How many times is that us? How many times do we say, I don't, I don't need directing. I don't need any help in this life. I got this. But I love what Jeremiah 10 says, because it's very clear. It says, I know, Lord, that our lives are not our own, but we're not able to, to plan our own course. We can't do it. We can't do it ourselves. We, we don't know what the right path for his name's sake is. We need his guidance. We need his direction, Right? And can I tell you that the encouraging thing is that we already have it. Listen to what it says in, in Psalms. It says, by your words, I can see where I'm going. They throw a beam of light on my dark path. I've committed myself, and I'll never turn back from living by your righteous order. Can I tell you that his direction is right here? 
His, his roadmap for us is right here. And what he's saying by this is that if you will follow me, I will lead you down the path that I have already created for you, which is the right path, which is the healthy path, which is the restoring path. You know what I'm saying? Which is the path that is right for you. David's are, are, God has already created, for it, created it. You gotta just listen. You gotta allow him to lead you. David goes on and he says this. He says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And the last characteristic that David gives us of of our shepherd is that the Lord is our protecting shepherd. The Lord is our protecting shepherd. I want you to remember the context that that, that, that the, the life situation that David is in right now, as he's writing these words, his son is trying to remove him from the throne. His son, as if that wasn't bad enough, his son is trying to kill him, right? But what I love about this is it doesn't change his perspective of the shepherd and the sheep. Even though you're walking through the, the darkest valley, I'm going to save you. Even though you're going through something that, that you feel like is scary and it's weary and you don't know if you're going to get out, I got you. I have a shepherd. Remember, I lack nothing, right? And I think this line is so powerful because he says, your rod and your staff, they, they comfort me. See, this rod was like a, like a baseball bat looking thing. And if there was anything Anything that would come up and try and mess with the sheep, they would use the rod to take care of it. The the staff was this staff that, yes, they used for guiding, but it had something on it that if if the sheep got stuck, if it got into a situation where they couldn't get out, the shepherd was able to pull the sheep back. Come on, he's saying the same thing for you. If you're feeling like you're up against something, our God has a rod and will take care of whatever you are going up against. If you're feeling stuck, if you're feeling lost, if you're feeling off path, our our shepherd shepherd has a staff that will take care, pull you back in to where you're supposed to be no matter what. You don't need to be fearful. You don't need to be worry-filled. Remember the promise that 2 Timothy gave us. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The Lord is your shepherd. You lack nothing. You don't need to fear. You don't need to worry because God will provide and God will protect you. And he says, for he is with me. Right? That's what he said before he said the rod and the staff. He said, for he is with me. He's right there with you. God is with us. And last I checked, God said, I will never leave you or I will never forsake you. So that promise, you can take it to the bank. Come on, because he is your shepherd. You might hear all this, and you might say, Pastor Tyler, that all sounds great, and I would love to have that kind of shepherd in my life, but I don't know Jesus like you do, and the reality is this, is that sheep will follow a shepherd because they know his voice, and if you're in here today and you don't know your shepherd's voice, we don't ever want to end a service without giving you the opportunity to say, you know what, I want that. I want him to lead my life. I want Jesus to shepherd me. He's calling out to you. He's close to you. Maybe this is that step that you need to take. Maybe you need to ask Jesus into your life. Maybe you need to tell that devil that he's got no hold on you and to tell your God that you're coming home. You might be in here, you might say, Pastor Tyler, look, that's great and all, but I've done too much. My sin is too heavy. I've done too much. I I can't accept that gift. No, wrong. Our God loves you so much, you so much, that he gave his only son to take care of that sin, to take care of that addiction, to take care of that stronghold, whatever you were going through. We don't want to end this without giving you an opportunity to receive the free gift of salvation and give and surrender your heart to Jesus. So all across the room, if you would, would you just bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? 
And would you put your hand over your heart as a symbol of your soul? And I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. And I believe you rose from the grave. And I believe that your blood washes away all of my sins. Come be a part of my life. Today, I commit my life to you. I am chosen. I am loved. I am forgiven. And I matter. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you just flood the hearts and the minds of every single person in this room. God, I pray that shame, condemnation are leaving in the name of Jesus. Drought is leaving in the name of Jesus. God, chains are breaking in the name of Jesus. And your purpose, your love, your fulfillment begins to fill every single part of their body, Father. We love you in Jesus' name. And now with every head still bowed, every, every eye still closed, if you said that prayer for the first time, and you didn't have a relationship with Jesus, but you're just now stepping into a relationship with Jesus. Or maybe you said that prayer and you, you had a relationship with Jesus, but you strayed away from the path and you're, you're rededicating your life to Jesus. In just a second, I'm going to ask you to do something really big and really bold. In just a second, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And I do that for two reasons. Right now, it's just me, you, and God. But I want that visual because you are not alone in this, and I want to be praying for you in this new journey of yours. The secondly... This is your time. This is your time to take that step, to tell that devil that he's got no hold on your life, to tell that sin that you're not defined by it, to tell that struggle that it does not tell you where you're going, and to tell your God that you are coming home. And so if that was you, on the count of three, I want you to boldly raise your hand because we're going to celebrate. One, no looking around. Two, be excited about this. Change happens right here. And three, if that was you today, would you raise your hand?